This week on FX Guide TV. We look at the 10 films in the Oscars visual effects bake-off with behind the scenes making ofs and breakdowns. And we check out the new January 2014 term at FX PhD. This podcast is brought to you by New Gate, which includes countless exciting features and updates. In New Gate, artists will notice huge improvements and an enhanced user experience that will make New Gate even better across multiple industries. This and more coming up next. Hello, I'm Angie Dale and welcome to FX Guide TV. This Thursday night, the VFX faithful gather in downtown LA to hear and see the work representing the 10 films in the running for this year's VFX Oscar. From these 10 films, the five nominees will be decided. Now, as the annual VFX Oscar Bake Off only allows a brief set of actual clips from the film with no making ofs or behind the scenes footage, we decided to do our very own version. So, here now is Mike Seymour with a special FX Guide rundown of the 10 films in this year's Oscar race, but with loads more before and afters and making of clips. That's right, Angie. Actually, I've been to the Bake Off in LA. It's great in terms of meeting people, but yeah, you can only see clips from the film. There's a brief introduction by whoever is presenting for that film, and then that's it. So we thought we'd just run through, given it's award season, it's a great opportunity to highlight the work of the artists involved. We'll run through the 10 films that we shown at the Bake Off, but we can bend the rules a bit. We can show you sort of making of and highlight what we think are some of the best aspects of each of the 10 films that are on show. And let's start with Gravity. Tim Weber headed up this incredible visual effects masterpiece. I mean, primarily the work was done at Framestore with help from Rising Sun and Prime Focus. I think their primary achievement was producing such amazing photorealistic effects, oftentimes using, of course, the actors, real faces, but everything else digital. Um, and this involved this innovative LED lighting box that they set up, as well as cameras that were robotically controlled by the guys at uh, Bot and Dolly, who are now owned by Google. Um, and of course, the team shot the actors in these rigs that could move the actors around relative to the boxes and the cameras could move in. It was all rendered in Arnold. Um, I think the team should be particularly praised for how long some of these shots are, because in addition to the sort of the technical rendering side of it, just pulling off the choreography of the shots was incredible. In fact, the entire film of Gravity only has 156 individual edits in it, which is amazing. Best shot for us was the debris shot that starts the whole thing rolling at the begin when Dr. Stone uh, gets spun out of control. Just brilliant work. ILM features very prominently in this year's award season roundup. Uh, Pacific Rim, I guess, heads that out. John Knoll headed up the team at ILM, which uh, was also helped out by guys over at Ghost Effects, Bass, uh, Rodeo, Mirada, Hybrid. Uh, and also I think they used some practical stuff that was provided by Legacy and 3210. The battle scenes that we tackled are all quite complex in terms of just the recipe that, that is required to make a shot. And this is, a, for me, a major animation film. Like, yes, there were some very large, very impressive water sims, and of course, a lot of destruction, but the art shown by the animators in moving the Jaegers in such a way as to make them still seem incredibly big, but also move them fast enough to make action sequences was particularly clever. If you move them too fast, you lose the scale. If you move them too slow, you lose the audience. So I think it was outstanding work. Actually, it was also outstanding use of an ocean-going tanker as a baseball bat. <laughs> I think ILM used uh, primarily Arnold, though also used V-Ray. Joe Letteri and the Weta digital team have built an incredibly well-earned reputation for doing outstanding character work. But their animation of Smog in The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smog, is got to be a masterclass in character animation. Smog is one of the most exceptionally crafted and executed characters we've seen on the screen, full stop. It's just a masterclass in animation. The lighting, the texturing, it all comes together really, really well. Well, um, we find that every time we have to do a large character, this goes back to the, to the King Kong days, of trying to strike that right balance of, of mass and proportion and weight, but still carry through with the subtlety that the animation requires. And of course, the thing about it is that they were trying to tackle a character in Smog with obviously the high frame rate and everything else in this roller coaster ride, with everything else that was going on from barrel rides to water sims to spiders to a couple of hundred billion pieces of gold, all of that was important. 
But, but the sheer brilliance and the presence of this digitally animated character on screen, its ability to convey emotion, that's what I think what a digital team did really well with Smog. Most monsters just need to scream and yell. Smog needed to be inquisitive, arrogant, intelligent, and scary. And it had really heavy dialogue sequences, which came very, very close to a character design that really didn't lend itself very well to lip sync animation. Well, not without somehow drifting off into making the character look comical or silly, which they never did. That reptilian head never strayed away from providing an emotional performance. Rendered in Render Man, it was exceptional work. Well, that is right about on time. The Lone Ranger is a fun Saturday morning adventure film with ILM's digital environments once again providing a great stage for some brilliant on-screen visual effects. Much of the environment in the uh, pipeline at ILM there is V-Ray with 3DS Max workflow, which is kind of interesting. In fact, Dan Wheaton, who heads ILM's Digimat team, told us in an FX Guide article that it was because V-Ray crushed the renders, to quote him directly. Um, the team also used Speedtree to create a lot of digital trees and shrubbery and vegetation, all of which was fully 3D, not 2.5D using cards. Lone Ranger had some great miniature work. Um, New Deal Studios did some great work, and it was also nice to see a fifth scale miniature, I think from 3210, who did that railway uh, bridge sequence. Shot old school on VistaVision. But as cool as the old school stuff was, I think it's the digital train stuff that really took center stage. Our favorite shot being one actually at the beginning of the film, where they uh, reach the end of the tracks. For World War Z, Scott Farrar stepped in to work mainly with the UK effects companies MPC and CineSight to deliver a film that really beat all expectations. It was dramatic, scary, engaged with an audience, and also provided some of the largest crowd sims we actually saw. The zombie crowd sequences were primarily provided by MPC, which used its proprietary Alice toolset, as well as rigid body solver Pappy, which allowed some really cool ragdoll sims. Uh, CineSight provided the truck crash and a load of other zombies running around the place. Um, and we want to do a particular shout out to the onset and prop scanning teams of companies like 2H3D and 4D Max. These scanning teams basically have been popping up a lot this year. They provide really good, clean scans and huge data sets for a variety of projects. Uh, with their dedicated teams and their very good scanning stations, they provided hundreds of models and effects to the companies that were doing all of the zombies. And really, as a set of companies, seemed to come into their own right this year. We also want to do a shout out to the stereo conversion team at CineSight and Prime Focus. Our favorite shot was, of course, the attack on the wall. And we had one live action shot of zombies hitting the wall and trying to climb up on top of one another. And we did clever camera tricks like lean the wall over, in actual fact, roll the camera over so actually the actors could climb up further than they'd normally do. Then on top of that, we put in a few CG zombies also climbing up on the real people. So it's a mix and match deal again to try and enhance this zombie behavior. <laughs> Image Engine really excelled this year with building on their earlier work in District 9 to deliver not only drones, but incredible environment and space shots for director Neil Bloomkamp in Elysium. VFX Soup Peter Misers led the team as they built a really gritty future on the ground and a floating nirvana in orbit. The amount of data that we had to render and calculate was astronomical. And yes, you use all the tricks in the book, but the complexity of transparent glass GI reflections, uh, you know, the ray tracing component was astronomical. Image Engine were helped out by Weta Workshop, who did that great Hulk suit, a Whiskey Tree, Method Studios, ILM, The Embassy, MPC, Kerner Optical, and Masters FX. Those grand shots of Elysium were really a high watermark for the Arnold renderer, just gorgeous shots in space. And of course, the Image Engine team did a great job with their use of practical stand-ins for everything from mocap actors standing in for robots, helicopters standing in for spaceships, 
and uh, some really great 3210, well, Kerner optical work uh, for the practical crash of the Raven on Elysium, one of our favorite sequences. Iron Man 3 raised an already really high bar on flying suited superheroes. This film seemed to be a really great collaboration between a ton of facilities such as Digital Domain, Weta Digital, Framestore, Scanline, Trickster, Fuel, VFX, Luma Pictures and Method Studios. While the practical falling Air Force One sequence proved to be really successful and a lot of fun, for us it was the end destruction sequence with the multiple suits and the game of musical chairs that was really technically impressive. Weta delivered both a ton of different flying Iron Man suits and a really large complex environment which along with Guy Pearce's face, they all blew up. Chris Townsend did a stellar job producing a really consistent and interesting VFX film. <laughs> ILM's Roger Guy took Star Trek into the darkness with some really good help from Ben Grossman and the team at Pixar Mondo and Atomic Fiction headed up by Kevin Bailey. Star Trek is one of the most heavily mined pieces of cinema science fiction we have, and yet Roger and the team at ILM still managed to make a jump to warp speed seem fresh and visually interesting. We thought the opening red planet scene was brilliant, and the film delivered with a ton of great digital environments and space shots. Some of our favourites here in the office included the fight in San Francisco, the end of the film, and also earlier on, the fight or the attack on Starfleet headquarters. Roger had rigged up a nav cam wire rig on set to replicate the movement of the actual later to be added CG space or gunship. That gunship, of course, had headlights on it, so the wire rig was projecting the correct light on the set and moving in a replicatable way. Ben's team at Pixamondo then picked up on that and completely matched it with CG elements that sort of completed the destruction of the headquarters. But it's this attention to detail and also the combination of onset planning and really good sort of forward thinking that can elevate visual effects. And the best work this year exhibited exactly that. It was sometimes it was frightening hearing how many elements we had in each shot. You know, it would be like a hundred pieces of smoke or, you know, 60 elements of, uh, you know, embers or whatever. And uh, when you're doing CG work, it's not so much that you, you, you know, you can generate these elements, but they all have to work together. Tom Cruise fighting and knocking the living daylights out of Tom Cruise on a post-apocalyptic Earth was provided by Eric Barber and the team at DD for Oblivion. DD delivered some really great work this year, and like several other films this year, the film did not just all fall back on fixing it in post. In fact, the film for one of the key sets, the Sky Tower number 49 set, was actually built with a 500 foot wide and 42 foot tall screen projected by 21 digital projectors. This gave the team a 13K by 2K projected world that could envelop and surround the actors, providing realistic reflections complete with the shattered moon outside Earth. The film could run this individual setup for 20 minutes without a reset and dial in any particular time of day or night. And it's just one of the innovations in the film where a very digital savvy crew and a really experienced set of digital artists were pushing hard to do as much as they could in camera in new and technically interesting ways. Another example being their work they did with the incredible bubble ship. Digital Domain was supported in this film by Pixel Mondo. Jake Morrison headed the visual effects up for Thor The Dark World, one of this year's, I guess, most anticipated sequels. The film delivered on action style, gags, and some incredibly impressive digital environments. The main VFX houses were Deneg, uh, Blur Studios, which did nearly all, I think, of the prologue. Then there was Method Studios, Luma, and Third Floor, who once again delivered amazing previews. Certainly our favorite sequence was the attack on Asgard, the revisited or revised city 
I think it was just much more believable. Certainly better textured, really well lit, and generally a lot more detail than we ever saw before, which was great because it needed to stand up to it in this attack sequence. And it needed to contrast really nicely as it did with those amazing Icelandic and Norwegian locations in the rest of the film. Well done, you just decapitated your grandfather. Well, that's the rundown of the 10 films that you'll be able to have a look at if you are turning up to the Bake Off in LA on Thursday night. Um, if you can, don't forget to go to the bar beforehand. But if you can't make it, hopefully we've given you a taste of those 10 films that are in contention for those five coveted spots as being this year's nominees for Best Visual Effects. Of course, someone's going to win and they'll deserve it. But getting into this group is the, I mean, an amazing accomplishment. And of course, it's all voted by peers at this point. So it really means an enormous amount. Um, there are some really good films that actually even make it into the top 10 that we could, I guess, uh, cover. That's just how strong it was this year. There's just a really great set of visual effects films out there with terrific artistry from just so many of you around the world. Well, back to you in the studio, and though, of course, you guys will see me in a second in our preview of the upcoming term at FX PhD. Thanks, Mike. And congrats to all the teams who worked on all 10 films. Great work, guys. Switching gears now. Or maybe not, if you would like to one day work on an Oscar-nominated film yourself, but you're not quite there yet, then here's a rundown of the new VFX courses at FX PhD for the January term, which has just started. Hi, and welcome to the January 2014 term overview video. I'm John Montgomery, one of the co-founders of FX PhD. We'll be hearing from Mike Seymour in Sydney in just a bit. Before we get started, I just want to talk about this video. It's a chance for us to focus on the new courses at FX PhD. The professors do a recording and talk about what they've got planned for the term. But in addition to these new courses, we have a slate of well over a hundred other courses on offer. We've got a new 300 level course being taught by Russell Dodgson. He's an FX PhD member favorite prof. And we've also got a 200 level intermediate based course being taught by Daniel Smith, focusing on his favorite subjects, nuke and zombies. Let's hear from both of them what they've got planned for the term. Hey everybody and welcome to this new term of FX PhD and this intro to Nuke 308. Now as a nice coincidence this term is first running right after the release of Nuke 8. So as a byproduct of that we have a nice range of new tools and features to play with. This term we're going to start out with this 4K F65 aerial footage and it's a bit wobbly and it's not an ideal plate. Now in a parallel Houdini 209 course Jens is going to be crashing a plane onto this airfield. So our job for the first part of the term is to take this plate and turn it into something useful. We're going to be tracking it, scaling it, 3D stabilizing and then reprojecting the plate to make a nice new sequence. Following this, we're going to be taking these other aerial images and building a nice matte extension to turn this into a more isolated location. We will then reproject all of that footage and generate a final backplate asset to hand off to that Houdini course. Also this term, we're going to be getting deep into some of Nuke's more advanced 3D tools and focusing on a variety of subjects, one of which is point cloud generation. We're going to be looking at different ways of acquiring these point clouds, whether it be from LiDAR scans, perhaps from third-party 3D photogrammetry software, or using Nuke's own point cloud generator in tandem with its new still solver inside the 3D camera tracker. We're then going to look at how we can use those to assist our workflow. It's going to be an exciting term with some interesting challenges and hopefully some new challenges that come up along the way. So sign up, get stuck into it, and I look forward to seeing you all in the forums. Hi, I'm Daniel Smith for FX PhD, and this is Nuke 224, Zombie Panic. We're working on a short film called Zombie Pandemic, and we're going to be shooting with the Red Scarlet today. And we're going to have a lot of great fun learning the ins and outs of how to work on set to acquire lens distortion data, how to track, how to get effective parallax into your shot so that you can track them. Uh, we're also big on this course is we're going to focus on the latest release from the foundry of Nuke 8. Nuke 8 has some really great tools for 3D tracking and they, they also upgraded the uh, model builder tool and we're going to be reconstructing this environment in Nuke so we can use it for reflections and ambient light. We're going to focus on two amazing visual effect shots. The first one is called the decapitation. We're going to take an actor and we're going to slice him with a katana and we're going to remove his head and we're going to use photogrammetry, we're going to use CGI and image-based lighting to reconstruct the head that's going to fall off. And we're going to use two-dimensional uh, 
blood elements to create spurts and splatters. Next, we're gonna create a crawling torso of a zombie that is crawling along the ground but has no lower half. We're gonna use a bunch of different techniques to pull that shot off. Uh, we're also gonna use extensive clean plating. We're going to be using CGI projections in both Maya and Nuke. Um, we're also going to be capturing image-based lighting spheres. All in all, this is going to be a great course. Thanks guys, and as John said, we're focusing on trying to put that FX heavily into the FX PhD, and nothing does that more than a good Houdini course. And we have a great Houdini 209 course for you this term by Jens Martinson. Jens is a great TD. He's actually working at Framestore at the moment. Before that, he was at DNEG, worked on films like Fast and Furious, uh, Rush, Godzilla. And he's going to be looking at a lot of the new features that are in Houdini 13. Welcome to FX PhD and this Houdini course. My name is Jens Martinson. I'm going to take you through the process of making a fully rigged dynamic object and do all kinds of simulation on it. At the end of this course, you will be able to understand and do simulations the way I've done it for the last couple of years, involving rigid body dynamics, fire, smoke, and general debris simulations. SideFX has updated Houdini to version 13, so we will have a quick look at how the new features will help us do things more efficient and therefore iterate more times to get the final shot. We will do a proper shot towards the end of this course. We will have a backplate model and a match move camera. So, sign up and see you later. This term we're really excited to have the second in what we hope will be a continuing curriculum in digital map painting. Ludo's returning to teach a course centered around Photoshop. Basically the core skills and techniques that you need to do to work on and complete digital map paintings. Let's hear from him what he's got planned for this project-based course. Hey guys, I'm Ludo Yoshem and I'm going to be your instructor for the new term dedicated to digital map painting on FX PhD. In this term, we're going to go through different techniques dedicated to matte painting to try to explain everything about the grading, the use of the brushes, the clone tools, the transform, and uh, all the basic techniques that everyone who wants to do some matte painting should know. Um, let's go quickly through the different images that we're going to use during this term. On this one, we're going to try to explain all the tools related to cloning, cleanup, transform, and um, grading. Then we're going to go on this one and we try to work on a day to night. We're going to transform this picture like if it was shot during the night and uh, we're going to turn a few lights on and see how it can reflect the lights on the trees. Then we're going to move here and try to extend a little bit the amount of snow that we have in these streets. For this one it's going to be trying to transform this place which is quite clean, quite nice, into something that would have been abandoned for years. So it means that we want to see some trashes, some broken pieces, some graffitis, transforming this nice place into something old and abandoned. And then we're going to move on to this image, which is going to be our final project. And we're going to try to merge all the different techniques that we're going to learn during the term on this one by doing first a day to night this so transforming this at night turn few lights on and on the top of that we're gonna add some snow so we're gonna do a summer to winter and a day to night on this image and joining us for 303 advanced color theory is our good friend Charles Poynton welcome back thank you very much so it's been what two years since you taught two years exactly and well your courses are always very very popular what's gonna be in this new course We'll cover a bunch of new material. There's been ACES uh, obviously developing over the last couple of years, so we'll do the update on ACES. Uh, let me check my list and see what else we've got that's new. We've got uh, some discussion about the spectral details of both acquisition and display. Right. So I know that you did a bunch of experimentation with different light sources and different cameras, looking at the color mismatches. Yeah, we basically did a class in background a few terms ago, and we'll actually give you a link to that uh, in the course. But yes, we were looking at those incredible differences in the spectral frequency response, different lights, just causing very different effects, yet both are right. theoretically set to, say, tungsten or daylight. So I'd love to have a discussion about that in deep technical terms about what's going on underneath. But that spectral response stuff pushes right through to DCP and stuff as 
sort of at the other end of the spectrum, doesn't it? It, it? it matters in both places. It matters both at acquisition in terms of how the camera senses color, but it also matters at exhibition in terms of how our eyes sense color from display devices with different properties. Right, and so OLEDs we'll, are being particularly good example. Of OLED at the back end is a very good example of that, and there's emerging laser projector technology that will also have effects there. So we'll talk about those things at the back end at exhibition. We'll also talk in some detail about what's going on spectrally at acquisition. Yeah, we've covered a little bit of the spectral acquisition stuff, but as it pertains to like DCP and stuff, I think that's really, really important. We'll do both. Of course, the other thing we want to really highlight is this is a 300 level course. So Charles is obviously very qualified to, to give us that, but it's great to be able to dig into these things in some real depth. We will do. Now, we're keen for you to sort of uh, give us uh, feedback throughout the term and uh, feed stuff in. And I also should sort of let you in on a bit of a secret. Charles is just finishing his doctorate right now, and you're going to actually publish some of your research in this very course. I will do. Uh, I've done a lot of research on what amounts to the th visual theory underneath the ACES pipeline. And so I've got some research results, a couple of which have been submitted and one has been accepted for publication in research journals. I'd like to hand those over to you and the guys and share those research results. So if somebody is watching and they have seen, say, your 301 course, is this just a repeat or is it new material? There will be plenty of new material. I mean, I think that nothing in 301 has become obsolete, but the world has changed in the last two years. And so there will be plenty of new material. Brilliant. Welcome to Real World Lighting and Rendering in Arnold. This 200 level course is ideal for anyone interested in learning one of the hottest renderers around today. Our course begins with a brief overview of Arnold's history, an introduction to physically based rendering and the correct use of linear colour workflow in the application. After an initial mini project designed to get everyone up and running, we'll dive straight into the specifics of render settings. These will include a detailed look at samples, ray depth and other important settings designed to give you the best looking renders in the shortest amount of time. Next up we'll move into Arnold's physically plausible lights. These include area, photometric and mesh and we'll see how image based lighting works and the various real world settings such as exposure, degrees Kelvin and the use of gobos and barn doors. From lighting, we'll move into cameras and look in detail at things such as depth of field, rolling shutter and exposure. Next up, we'll be looking at shaders, starting with Arnold's main standard shader, which is capable of producing all types of material, including plastics, glass, metal, car paints or skin. We'll also be looking at creating subsurface scattering shaders, shadow catchers, wireframe shaders and ray switching. With the fundamentals covered, we'll turn our attention to more advanced features such as object settings. These include things like Catmull Clark subdivision surfaces, MIP mapping and the ability to render curves. We'll then be looking at AOVs or arbitrary output variables, including all the passes needed to rebuild the beauty. And we'll be looking at various utility passes, including motion vector, normal point and the new deep image data output. The remaining few classes of the course will cover such things as particles, volume fluids, hair and fur, stand-ins, environmental fog and atmospheric volume scattering. Our last week we'll look at some of the more technical features such as make TX, command line batch rendering, as files, kick and the importance of the log files. Now if you're still unsure whether this course is for you, just have a look at this year's list of films for the VFX Oscar Bake Off. Arnold has been used on 7 out of the 10 potential nominees. This is the time to get on board and this is the course for your ticket into the world of Arnold. So we've got a killer 300 level based new course. We've got a 200 course focused on zombies, digital map painting and the sexiest course of all, the pack shot. Now, of course, that's certainly not sexy, but the reality is it's commerce, right, in our job. And over the years, I've had to do a ton of product shot replacements, fixes, or total creation from scratch. And that's where this course comes in. P. Harwig returns to show you various ways in which you can create really great pack shots to make your clients happy. Hello out there. Uh, welcome to the FX PhD uh, lighting and rendering pack shots um, course. In this course, we will be uh, building a handful of, uh, of these pack shots using um, a host of different softwares, uh, Maya, V-Ray, Nuke, PF Track, and Photoshop. 
um, we'll be discovering or looking at different ways of, of lighting pack shots. We'll be working with uh, some simple boxes, like box products, and we'll be rendering uh, some electronic gadgets just to have all these nice different features uh, that these things seem to have these days. We'll be working with replacing a pack in a piece of shot footage. And then we'll, of course, look into uh, what's important when you do a pack shot. Um, make sure that your client's colors stay true to the colors on their products. If your client decides that the, uh, the shot looks fine, but it would be awesome if, say, you could change the label. So we're definitely going to be looking at that too. And of course, we will end up with a, a class or two going through nice little tips and tricks and things we can do, uh, adding dust uh, and volumetrics and all those little things that really sell the shot. I know pack shots sound probably a little bit boring. It's not spaceships, not explosions, but it is uh, a very big part of what we do as 3D artists. I really hope to see you in this class and that we'll have a lot of fun. That's it for me. And now to Mari, where we have two courses, a 100 level course by Brittany Drew and a 200 level course by Mickey Rogers. Now, these both focus on Mari, of course, at different levels. Mari is such a key tool for painting and texturing these days. We're really keen to have these, both introductory level course and a 200 level course. Brittany will take you through what makes Mari so good, and especially its connections to things like Photoshop and other applications. Well, Mickey is going to look at the latest version, and an important point I know for many of you is that now with Mari at version 2.5, you can actually run Mari on a Mac, as you'll hear the guys explain. Hello everyone, and welcome to Mari 102, Introduction to Mari. I'm Brittany Drew, and I'll be your instructor for this course. In this course, we'll be exploring the awesome flexible power that is the robust Mari software. We address using Mari in your texture painting workflow, including using it in conjunction with other software, such as Maya, Mudbox, and Photoshop. Using the latest version of 2.5, you'll be able to work within the layer system you know, like from Photoshop, within a 3D space. We also cover essential texturing techniques to get the artist up and running with Mari in no time. The program was originally developed during movie production at Weta, built to keeping the artist's needs in mind. Since its release to the public three years ago, it's gained a lot more in its toolset, continuing to grow with the foundry through user input. You'll see it's very intuitive to the texture artist's needs, but you'll also find that there are a lot of nooks and crannies of tools, options, and spiffy things that make it all the more powerful. I'm really excited, and I hope you guys will be too. Looking forward to teaching everyone. Hey everyone, and welcome to Mari 201, Intermediate Mari Techniques. My name is Mikey Rogers, and we're going to go on a little adventure together, exploring the many possibilities of Mari 2.0 and above. I'd like to point out, however, that we'll be using Mari 2.5, which brings us support for Mac OS X. In this course, I'd like to concentrate on just a couple of hero models, along with some supporting assets. We're going to take this amazing jet fighter pilot and banged up jet wing from gray to textured, look dev and lit in 10 exciting weeks. We'll start things off from the beginning in order to discuss why both photo reference and concept art are important to find before the paint job begins. We'll talk about why Mari thrives on multi-tile UV objects and how we can use them to get to our desired results quicker. I'd like to make sure you understand how your maps will end up being used in the look development process. So we'll spend a little bit of time at the end of each class testing our maps in the popular look development software V-Ray. We'll cover everything from diffuse, reflection, gloss, bump, and even map passes to be used in lighting or compositing. We'll even get to play around with the amazing photo manipulation application Lightbrush by Tandon that does some pretty amazing things with your source photography, like paint out light information in minutes, a generally painful and tedious task. The final couple of classes will be left up to you all on whether you'd like to completely light and composite the model, or if you'd rather just finesse your maps, that's cool too. So buckle up, pilots. It's going to be one hell of a ride. We're really excited to have Brian Mulligan back this term to teach a new course on editing and effects in smoke. 
Now it is centered in smoke, but I want to say that for people like me who are flame artists, I know a lot of you are jumping into the 20th anniversary edition or 2014 for the first time. And the fact is you're probably going to be doing a lot more in the timeline. So I think this is going to be a value for you as well. But let's hear directly from Brian, his plans for the course. Hello, I'm Brian Mulligan. Smoke 210 will have a lot to offer every smoke user. This class will explore smoke as an NLE and really show how functional smoke is as an editorial cutter with its media management, workflows, and trimming operations. Hotkeys are a must to know and learn. Many operations are available for customization, and I'll show you what I think are the best options for working fast with the keyboard. Users will also find out what smoke is doing with media management under the hood at the OS level, and I'll go over how to recover libraries from backups in case you'd ever need to. This class will also have some fun projects exploring ConnectFX compositing and effects in building this 3D space disco scene created mostly from Photoshop stills. I'll share some custom lens flares and show you how to build and customize your own. And since everybody is doing more green screen work, I'll break down the modular keyer and show you how to make your keys look better with all the nodes inside this very powerful and flexible keyer. So I hope you'll join me. I think we'll have a lot of fun exploring the editing and effects workflows of Autodesk Smoke. If you're a Flame user, new to the 2013 Anniversary Edition or 2014 workflows with the timeline and editing, I think there's a lot you'll get out of this course as well. I'll see you in class. And now to Previs. We have a UNR 201 course, which is Gorilla Previs, and it actually builds and picks up directly on the previous 101 course. The idea here is that John Grease is going to take basically the Unreal Gaming Engine and show you how to use it for really cool sort of street down in the trenches previous. And not only that, I really love working with John because he's just so enthusiastic and he's so keen to exploit technology to actually get stuff done. Hi, this is John Gress and welcome to the Orientation Week video for UNR 201, Tech Gorilla Previs with UDK. In this course, we pick up right where we left off with UDK in the 101 course, adding to your new knowledge of how all the components of this amazing development environment can be integrated. And by introducing current, new, and breaking Tech Gorilla Previs concepts, techniques, hardware, software, tips and tricks, which will allow you to create amazing Previs in record time with ease. We will cover all of the essential facets in the creation of an effective pre-visualization and explore breaking new, accessible, in the trenches, Gorilla Previs tech from amazing new instant 360 degree environment Skydome creation tools, cutting edge breakthroughs in photogrammetry, hardware and software, which will surely be the future for lightning fast interior and exterior location sets, custom terrains using satellite DEM digital elevation models and space shuttle radar topography SRTM maps, procedural extraction and modeling techniques, new tech for the custom creation of characters, props, and lightning fast digital doubles, creating your own home mocap system, bringing motion track live action cameras and Hollywood visual effects into UDK, building your own virtual UDK camera, and much, much more. I am really excited to be bringing you this course this term at FX PhD and hope you'll join me. I look forward to seeing you week one and in the forums. Those of you who are new to FX PhD may not realize that we have a great selection of VPN software for you to use to follow along with the courses. Now, what is VPN software? Well, basically what happens is you create a secure connection between your computer and our server, and when you launch a software application, it requests a license from our server, and you can run it. These are the full version of various software packages like Mari, Maya, and Nuke. We have a full software listing on our site, so be sure to check it out, but it's one of the great benefits at FX PhD. Well, that's it, other than to highlight background fundamentals. This is the free magazine style show or class that you get each week. We provide this as a service to PhD members. It's a magazine style show that is, I guess, a bit like a course, but the thing about it is we tackle a different subject each week. So we'll look at the tech behind the industry. Sometimes it's about the business aspects or the finance or how to negotiate. It's all the stuff that wouldn't normally fall into a course and that's free with any uh, membership here at FX PhD. It's been incredibly popular since we started it some 31 terms ago. Any other thing to do is highlight the point that John mentioned at the outset, which is this is just the new courses. That's what we're highlighting here. Ton of other courses available. Some are the repeat courses, which also have the professors there answering questions. Some are just the vault courses for immediate download. It's all available at fxphd.com. Uh, just look under our courses. Okay, well, I hope to see you in the forums. I hope you'll join us this term. It should be a cracker. I'm Mike Seymour. Thanks so much. 
Thanks, guys. Well, we are way over time. But hey, until next time, you can follow us on Twitter at FX Guide News. See ya. For more industry news, in-depth features, podcasts and forums, check out fxguide.com. And for visual effects training, check out fxphd.com.